Hello, I'm the Proverbs 2716 woman, and I thank you very much for joining me for another one of my nagging thoughts. If this is your first time joining me and you would like more short form entertaining content, I would like to invite you to follow me on Instagram where the bulk of my videos are less than 15 seconds. That being said, if you do enjoy reasoning through the word of God, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to my nagging thoughts on whatever platform that you are currently listening to them on. Without any further ado, I'd like to turn my attention this week to the topic of divorce. And this is such a large topic within the Word of God that I will break it up into a series of episodes. This week, my focus is going to be Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12. And without any further ado, let me go ahead and just read that in the New English translation so we can hear what the Word of God has to say. Then some Pharisees came to him in order to test him. They asked, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that from the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? Jesus said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning, it was not this way. Now I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the case of a husband with a wife, it's better not to marry. He said to them, not everyone can accept this statement except those to whom it has been given. For there are some eunuchs who were that way from birth, and there were some were made eunuchs by others, and some who became eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. To the one who is able to accept this should accept it. Before I get into my main points that I think are largely overlooked in this passage, I would like to address a couple of issues here. Um, in verse 9, uh, where it says, uh, whoever divorces except for immorality... That word that uh, the New English translation is rendering immorality is uh, the Greek word porneia. And um, it is a term that means sexual immorality and it is a much broader term than adultery. I have heard some grace-based churches making the argument that porneia really is restricted to the betrothal period. And that it is referring exclusively to fornication and or adultery that occurs specifically within the betrothal period. Interpreting uh, that word that way leads you to the conclusion that there's absolutely no immorality, no sexual immorality, including adultery, that is a legitimate reason to get a divorce. My personal opinion, which you didn't ask for, is that, that this logic is absolutely absurd, that God would somehow, for some reason, hold the betrothal period of a marriage in a more sacred space and in a higher standard than the marriage itself. But fortunately, you don't have to just simply take my um, opinion or comment on that. Um, the fact is that uh, turning that word porneia into this restrictive meaning that it only applies within the betrothal period and it's only referring to an infidelity that occurs during that specific time period. That is a very clear eisegesis. That's a term that means you are imposing extra things on the text that you are simply not extracting from the text itself. That is not what this word means, and it is not what is described in, in the Greek. There is a very clear way to express those ideas in the Greek, and it is simply not contained in the text. So um, I do want to point that out. The um, other thing, so I want to get now into my main points, which is that a lot of Christians tend to glom onto verse 6, where it says, What God has joined together, let no one separate. They will glom onto this extract it from the entire counsel of the word of God and come away with the conclusion that 
it's a holy, noble, wonderful thing to cling to the idea that divorce is simply not an option for Christians. Like, I will just simply not allow that idea in my head. And it very often uh, is is done in kind of an elevating way that I'm a superior, moral, a morally superior Christian when I take this stance that divorce is just simply not an option. I will not fail. This This marriage will not end in divorce. Um, as if divorce in of itself is a sin, but that is completely unbiblical and I can prove it, uh, very simply by going to Jeremiah chapter three, verse eight, where you can read for yourself how God himself went through a divorce with his beloved. What's so particularly poignant about that divorce is the fact that God himself is perfect. So therefore, the fact that he's been through a divorce is evidence conclusively that divorce in of itself is not sinful. Number two, because God himself has the, he is the only one who has the power to supernaturally remove a heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And knowing that he has that power and yet... He set the precedent of going through a divorce is extremely poignant because there's not one of us who has the power to remove a heart of stone from anybody else except from our, our own heart. Um, and uh, if you need proof of that, you can take a look at Ezekiel uh, chapter uh, 18 verse 31. Um but in any case, we don't have that power to remove a heart of stone out of our our spouse. God does, and yet he went uh, through a divorce. So when the word of God says what God has joined together, let no one separate, it is not saying divorce is not an option. It is not. Um the next uh, point that I'd like to make is coming from uh, Matthew nineteen eight, and that is where it says um, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts, but f- from the beginning it was not this way. Again, Christians typically focus in on the latter part of this statement that from the beginning it was not this way. God's plan is for you to not be divorced. The most important thing is that you stay together, and they are glossing over the point and the compassion that God has um, for the one that is trying to be one flesh with somebody who has a hard heart. God did not permit through Moses, the face of the law, uh, his beloved, his community of believers to divorce, um, because of hard hearts, because God wants to empower sin. He didn't do it for the hard hearted. He did it for the spouse of the hard hearted. Uh, Because God is a compassionate and merciful God. And uh, that is absolutely why. And I think that the example that he set by giving over his beloved over to their sins is further proof of that. Or at least uh, corroborates uh, that notion. Um, That being said, I do want to point out that a lot of Christians, when they're focusing in on uh, this uh, hard-heartedness and that this was not God's plan, that divorce is God, not God's plan. They uh, tend to talk about the, the theological arguments that were going on in Jesus's day. And very famously, this uh, school of Hillel was teaching and advocating for frivolous divorce among the community of believers. And it was uh, teaching believing men to divorce their wives for any reason up to and including burning dinner. So you throw the the mother of your children and the woman you've pledged her life to, you throw her out like yesterday's garbage for the the most trivial reason, uh, How if she displeases you in, in even the slightest manner, you just throw her out like garbage. Um, I just want to say, um, I can testify that actually throwing somebody out when you have a hard heart and you're willing to, to, to throw them out over something so trivial, that's actually a more honorable, honest and kind thing to do than it is to expect, uh, that same person that you despise, uh, and, and have such contempt for. Uh, to have that person try to be one flesh with you and to be subjugated to you in, in marriage. 
And again, fortunately, you don't have to take my opinion for it because maybe I'm a crazy anomaly. You can take the word of God um, to, to cooperate what I'm saying. You can look at um, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 11, and you will see that God himself says that the one who is turning their back on him forthrightly, it can be, under those circumstances, considered more righteous than the one who trifles with a m- marriage uh, uh, by um, remaining hard-hearted and a slave to sin. So again, that references uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 11, to corroborate what I'm saying, that uh, the problem is, or the focus, I should say, by Christians should not be on saving the marriage, as if God died for the institution of marriage. God did not die to save marriage. He died to save sinners. He died to save people. He has compassion on people and especially his people who are one flesh with him in, in, in a spirit sense as our spiritual spouse, trying to be one flesh with somebody who has a hard heart. Um, what, what we should be hearing when we're hearing, um, preachers talk on uh, and preach and teach on the topic of marriage and divorce is against sexual immorality, against pornea, and against hard-heartedness, not against divorce, because divorce is not a sin. Um, But these other things are. Sexual immorality and hard-heartedness are. And if we want strong marriages, that's where the focus should be. Um, The last thing that I just want to say um, is really that in verse 9, which is uh, where it says, um, whoever divorces and marries another commits adultery. It's fascinating to me that really the sin here is not the divorce. It's the remarriage. And there's actually uh, more in the Word of God on this topic, Um, not only on the topic of marrying um, somebody else and who's guilty for that. Um, The Word of God has more to say on even remarrying your same spouse after a divorce. And I'm going to save that for another nagging thought, which I hope you will join me for. And please do share and comment with what your thoughts are, because I'd very much like to hear them, particularly if you disagree. And I'd like to hear uh, you make the case as uh, to why. So with that being said, I look forward to talking to you next week. God bless.